appeared by the board. So, <laughs> by the way, thank you for the uh, citizens for showing today. Uh, and it's uh, it's nice to be able to talk to somebody from countywide rather than just the basics of those who uh, reside in the port. We represent roughly about a third of the population in, uh, uh, in Mason County. Uh, I brought three boards that represent the three properties that uh, we have under our control. Obviously, the first one is the airport. This happens to be our number one asset. Uh, Wasdot Aviation Division, by the way, based on their uh, own studies indicate that we touch approximately $41 million in gross business income annually because of this airport. 75% of our air traffic that comes in and out of this airport, by the way, is transient. It's not local. It's not just the local pilots that are using it. But one of the things that's of interest to me and to my commission is the fact that even though we save $41 million, it really should be double that. And one of the major challenges that this port has, of course, and what we have as a, an airport sponsor, as all airports do, and that is how do you operate in all weather conditions? And that's probably the biggest challenge that we've had for the last 20 years to see the development of the airport. And finally, I can say that it looks like the FAA, uh, in this first quarter, will introduce to us what's called a new LPV GPS style approach will finally allow the corporate jet uh, flyers, if you will, and corporate owners to fly in and out of this airport in all weather conditions. I want to take 30 seconds and just give you a, a, a challenge that, that hit me when I looked at the airport when I first arrived here. If you look at Olympia and corporate jets that fly in and out of that, there's what's called an instrument landing system. You look at Tacoma Narrows, same thing, instrument landing system, corporate jets, Bramerton, same thing. Even Hoquiam, if you think about it, and yet Hoquiam only has 20 airplanes based at that airport. Yet a couple of those happen to be corporate jets, and that's because they have an ILS system. We're sitting here with 107 aircraft and no way to get home. So we're very pleased to announce that hopefully uh, come uh, the first quarter, hopefully this month, if not next, uh, we'll see the new next-gen system arriving here. Um, I wanted to take 30 seconds and go back and just review briefly about ports, because I know not everyone is familiar with how we operate and explain that 85% of our growth comes from within by helping companies that are currently here and helping them grow. And I have permission to use this company's name, so I'm going to talk briefly about it. The company's called TrueFab. And TrueFab uh, is a, a metal manufacturing company. They do some parts for Boeing. Uh, they do some uh, work for the Navy, et cetera. But it wasn't always TrueFab. Uh, in history, uh, a couple of years ago, it was a company called OlyFab, and they were going into bankruptcy and closing down. They owed the port in a lease obligation about $175,000 uh, worth of rent. Uh, lo and behold, I'm going to shorten this down, they had approximately $175,000 uh, worth of equipment and small tools and machine equipment. Uh, so we made them a, a swap, if you will. We said, you can leave early on your lease, but we keep the small equipment. Immediately went to two individuals who formed a new company called TrueFab. TrueFab had a single source contract with the Navy to produce a device that's used by the Navy SEALs. Um, and that was a $1.4 billion contract. And the Navy was offering 40% of that cash up front. So the key there is they had cash flow. So when we look at a company as to how we're going to work with them, one of the things we look at is their balance sheet. Number two, we look at the cash flow of the company. So. We invested in that. We had about a two-week risk. They took off, and lo and behold, we still kept not all of the jobs, but we kept about 25 to 30 jobs in place under the new name TrueFab. Now, the next piece of that, though, and this applies to all of the companies that are on our port property and how we try to work with them, um, we have TrueFab again looking to do some expansion. Now, they're talking, and that's all this is at this point. They're talking with a company in Canada about building trailers. Now these trailers are huge, 300,000 to 600,000 pound trailers that are used in the mining industry down in South America. The problem is when you're working in that environment, you need cranes that have a capacity to lift some of that equipment. So our <coughs> building that they have, by the way, and I should probably point this out here, is where TrueFab is at. Inside the structure of that building are cranes that have a 30,000 pound capacity. So they need at least 60,000 pounds. So what we'll be looking at is the possibility of adding on the $750,000 building to that and incorporating the 60,000 pound cranes and that brings more jobs and hopefully will double the size of TrueFab. But that's just simply the way that we work with individual companies you know, on port property. So the, the, the key to ports overall for all electives to understand and for the public to understand is we need to be competitive in rates, we need to be competitive uh, you know, with our infrastructure and we need to look at companies that want to come here as though they're our own because obviously when they arrive here, they become family because guess who ends up being employed 
by those companies. So it's critical to understand that the way the courts operate, which is different than cities and counties. Um, two things that are coming our way specific to the airport. Obviously, we've had a lot of inquiries from the 502 growers, the cannabis growers that want to come here. Uh, actually, on Friday, I'll be meeting with several of the companies. The challenges that we have with the cannabis growers, of course, is that under federal law, growing of cannabis is still illegal, so we have two major problems. Number one is banking. And you know, it's not one of those situations where you want to have your rent paid in a suitcase. You'd like to have a check. Uh, number two is, this is FAA property, and so there is a deed that oversees that, and there is also grant insurance agreements. Now, we have had uh, a, at least an informal, I'll say a formal letter from the FAA <coughs> indicating that uh, cannabis growers do not violate either the deed and or the grant agreement. So that we cleared that hurdle, but they have put us on notice that they're sending it up to D.C. for further investigation. But at the same time, we're moving forward, and my commission will have an interesting decision to make in, in the near future as to whether they want to go that route or not. Um, second piece of property is John's Prairie, and it's 400 acres, uh, and about a third of it is developed. There's two major companies, or three major companies out there, Simpson Lumber Company. Uh, you might recognize McFarland Cascade, but they've been bought out by a company called Stella Jones. Stella Jones represents 50% of the electrical pole market in the United States and about 50% of the rail tie market uh, in the United States, primarily on the East Coast. Um, but the thing that we're most concerned about and what we hope to be doing is, if you can maybe see this, this is the rail that comes up through from downtown Shelton, works its way up along our property line and continues on up to Bremerton. We have created a rail spur here that comes into this location. The problem is the port spent a tremendous amount of money building that, building the infrastructure, but we can't use it. I mean, you can, but you can't, and here's the problem. If you're within 75 miles of an existing loading facility, there's an agreement between Burlington Northern and the Union Pacific that says uh, you must take it to one of those reloads. We happen to be just about 73 and a half miles we need another mile and a half, maybe we could move it some way somehow, but um, I doubt that. So the challenge that we have right now is that if you are a manufacturer and you're producing a product that goes, say, to Chicago, that's going to go out on Burlington Northern, that's fine. Uh, no extra duties you can load here. If you want to go to the California market, now you're using Union Pacific, can't get there from here, you've got to literally put it on a truck, take it down to Chehalis, or take it up to Bremerton, where then you can load it, and then you can transition it out. So, Moral of the story is 2014, we have a, a major study that we're going to be trying to do to take a look at that, and I hope that it'll occur for anyone who knows anything about rail, because this is new ground for me. Uh, we're looking for some help to try to figure out what we can really use that rail system for and, and how we can uh, help attract more companies with that. Um, the last piece of property, of course, is the marina, and believe it or not, this has probably got more excitement and activity around it than we've had in a number of years. Uh, there is a what we call our north dock and south dock, which is strictly recreational, uh, and that needs to be rebuilt, and we're going to be working on that over the next two years. In fact, next week we'll bring our advisory committee in and have a conversation about that. We figure that's about $1.5, maybe $2 million. Um, the second thing that we're working on from the port's perspective is we own a piece of property down here in the corner uh, called Eagle Point, and our marina, the overwater portion, is here. We have this small little parking area here, but this area here is owned by Simpson Lumber Company. And Simpson is interested, the original project was to, uh, proposal was to do a swap between Eagle Point and the, what they call the log haul out, uh, and then do a habitat restoration project through here, which would gain greater public access to the marina. Uh, we're working on something a little different now, uh, but it still is uh, in the process of acquiring this land and Simpson and the port will joint venture a restoration project on that alone when that's complete. Uh, the idea then is that we would then purchase this piece of property and then take Eagle Point and put it into conservancy. That's really the only place or the only thing that that piece of property can do. But the neat thing about that that we're excited about is the long-term future. If we can do this, and I had a conversation with Alan Trickwell, the CEO from Simpson Lumber Company, once these two pieces uh, into a park and, and uh, restored, if you will, is to build a trail, a walking trail, and this ties in the city's ultimate plans, I believe, for a park and ride here, and bring that trail down Front Street and build a, uh, uh, a pathway over uh, Goldsboro and then farther down over the rail and continue that path all the way out. So in effect, 
give us a focal point for downtown Shelton. Now, how the retail uh, environment in Shelton wants to use that and tee off of that, I, I think there's some possibilities. It's going to be a long project, but I, I think there's something here that, that might benefit uh, the community overall. The last thing that I want to mention, though, which is happening at the marina, and this happened just about 18 months ago, started up, it's called aquaculture. It's the growing of shellfish, and in most cases, uh, you would see them going out to the shoreline and putting them in bags, but the problem is, what do you do from the sea? And so we have a number of growers that have acquired the boathouses and have created these FLUPSIs, and that stands for Floating Upwelling System. I had to think that one through a little bit. But they're inside the boathouse, so it doesn't really change the complexion of the marina, per se. Uh, the Department of Ecology has already uh, been involved, shoreline master plan, already doing uh, some work with that, both city and county. Nine of them have been permitted, we're allowed ten, and uh, I'm really excited and invited uh, Ray Peters and uh, Dave Johns from Squaxin Island Tribe because they're going to acquire the tenth boathouse, and that will limit our number. Uh, and the bigger picture of that is if the tribes and if the other owners of these uh, flopsies are successful within the next two to three years, we envision a commercial dock coming off that north side, coming up here, out, and back over. We've already had some drawings done to that effect, uh, and that's then where we will move the new commercial operations. So, a lot of exciting things, I think, happening down at the marina. So, that's everything from the port.